Well, Ford is now finished, and my prediction is they'll go bust in 2024. And there are five reasons why, and only one possible option for survival, the get-out-of-jail-free card. Dave takes it on, looks at what's happening to Ford, and that includes several others as well. Well, quick bit of history. Ford sales are down. Oh yeah, they're up from last year and the year before, but they're down overall. And that is because, first, the pandemic and its closures and lockdowns, then an international supply chain issue, then a worldwide chip shortage, now a recession. The disasters still keep coming, but sales were already falling year on year well before that. In fact, dropping from the peak in about 2016, when everything looked rosy. Now, all five of these reasons were entirely predictable and preventable. Reason one, ice cars have about reached their peak of development, as all products do. You only have to look at mobile phones. Once there was an absolute mad scramble to get the latest model, every year a new model came out, had a better processor, more memory, better camera, better screen, no LED. Each new model was just so much better. 2G, 3G, 4G, 12 megapixels, 24 megapixels, 4K video, OLED screens. The improvement was so amazing that we swapped phones regularly. Then the rate of change dropped dramatically. Once you're able to download a video or documents in, in a minute, then it came to 20 seconds, now it's just a second or so. The rate of improvement shrank. Same with the onboard camera. Once it was so poor, it was almost unusable. But now, the quality is superb. And can you really tell the difference between 12 and 24 megapixels? Really? Well, the rate of improvement has dropped significantly, and slowdown in sales is the obvious conclusion. Mobile phone sales have just stopped growing, and they're now pretty static. They're never going to stop selling altogether. We do wear out our phones, we drop them, we kill the batteries. So some people will always need a new one but it will be far less frequency, frequently and we'll probably not buy the flagship model anymore, maybe the second or third in line, maybe even the budget one. They are quite sufficient for most people. Well, so it was with cars. Once we did swap cars every two or three years because the replacement was so much better, but over the last decade that rate of improvement also has shrunk. Cars last a lot longer, even come with much longer warranties. The new super updated model is now unfortunately very little different to the one you're already driving. Well, maybe the new one offers LED headlights and 14 speakers instead of the previous eight, but a fuel economy and performance is almost identical, as is the comfort and space and standard features like adaptive cruise control. We were being encouraged to upgrade to the latest model that, in reality, was little better than what we already had. So, reason one, we're buying less cars, less often. A reason number two, as the auto manufacturers saw the slow but steady decline in new car sales, they simply raised their prices to maintain the same profit margin. And to justify those price rises, they began adding anything they could think of that cost them very little, but sounded great. A uh, Bose premium 14 speaker surround sound system probably cost them less than a thousand pound but they then charge an extra 4,000 for an audio package and it threw in 100 pounds worth of sound deadening. LED lights cost maybe 100 extra, but they charge 2,000 pounds for the lighting pack. New seat materials cost a few hundred extra, but the luxury trim package was maybe an extra 3,000. And then throwing in a bit of tech, they put in a bigger display screen, maybe a better processor, and these today just cost a few hundred, but again added thousands to the price. Cars suddenly cost an extra ten to twenty thousand pounds, but offered very little difference. But it worked. As sales numbers continued to drop, we were forced to buy ever more expensive cars with higher profit margins. Their turnover and profits recovered. Year on year, they looked a bit better. Looked like things were going well. Then dealers chipped in. Now, this is particularly true in America, but it happens over here. Ford sells his cards to dealers, and those dealers have got used to high profits and high sales. They're not going to give that up. So as sales declined, so the dealers ordered higher spec vehicles, and with a higher profit margin, shunning the base models altogether. And when Ford didn't provide enough extras to justify the ever-increasing prices, dealers invented their own. Again, far more so in America, 
Dealers added things like paint protection systems, £2,000, door edge protectors, £500, or a raised suspension package for £5,000. And luckily over there, but not yet here, a stupid idea of filling tyres with nitrogen for as much as £500. Well, first, what the hell does nitrogen actually do? You see, the air we breathe is already 78% nitrogen. What difference does it make? And then £500? I checked online, a massive cylinder, 300 bars pressure, is about £50. I don't know how many you can do, but I guess you can fill probably 100 or 200 tyres from that one cylinder. Do they, in fact, add any nitrogen at all? How would you know? Well, dealers did anything and everything to maintain turnover and profit, even adding market adjustments of several thousand pounds if a specific model was hard to get. In the UK, you just didn't get any discounts. Basic pickup trucks in America that used to fetch $40,000 five years ago were now up in the 70 to 80,000 region, and the top range models fetching well over 100k. Well, I should say asking over 100k because sales still declining. In fact, at a higher rate than before. So reason two, new vehicle prices have risen at, risen at an even faster rate to absurd le levels today. Reason number three, enter now the world recession. After the pandemic, the business world believed it would just bounce back and they would quickly end up selling more of everything than ever before at higher prices than before. After all, for a few years, they had sold a lot less. Surely there would be a sales boom to catch up. And there wasn't. Well, multiple reasons. Like people now were working from home, just didn't use their cars. Many people took the opportunity for early retirement, others opened their own businesses, others gave up cars altogether. Whatever the result was, the world in the automotive world did not bounce back. And in fact, the world economy still has not reached pre-pandemic pre -pandemic levels. In fact, far from bouncing back, it's getting deeper and deeper into recession. Sales of everything are still falling, and there seems no end in sight. So reason three, the world has not yet recovered from the pandemic and is slowing down even faster. Reason four, Russia invaded Ukraine, when the world's largest oil producers suddenly stopped exporting oil and oil-based products due to the sanctions, leading to a massive leap in the price of oil. And when the world's largest suppliers of grain and vegetable oil stopped supplies practically overnight. The result was massive increase in prices and inflation. Prices soared and we had shortages in supermarkets and panic buying that drove prices still higher. Everything costs more this year than last year. Fuel is dearer, food is dearer, energy bills are dearer. And governments only have one method for countering inflation. Higher interest rates. So interest rates began a massive climb that's still not yet stopped. If your mortgage goes up £500 a month and your wages don't, then you have to cut back elsewhere. If energy bills rise, there's little you can do about it other than pay. You have less money to spend on other things. And as inflation continued, mainly because it was caused by exceptional circumstances, so the increase in the cost of borrowing continued. Traditional methods of tackling inflation simply didn't work because the underlying cause was different. Inflation, for many years almost totally unheard of, suddenly rocketed to 10%, 15% and even higher. The reason for, with everything dearer than last year, we just have less spare money to spend on non-essentials than we had last year. Reason five, that's a big one, the banks were caught out massively in 2008 when many went bust and others survived by pure luck and a massive government bailout. So this time around, they're not going to be caught out. For far too many years, interest rates have been ridiculously low. and We've taken advantage of those rates and loaded up with debt. It was too good to be true, and it is because it's now come to an abrupt end. For some time now, lending has become significantly more expensive. Well, first, banks now only offer those semi-sensible rates to those with absolutely perfect credit scores, where the bank is all extremely likely to get paid back in full. All the rest of us get penalised. If a borrower might not possibly be able to repay, repay in full, then a much higher interest rate means the bank might just recover enough while they are paying to cover the interest lost when they finally default. So, from interest rates down at just a few percent, 
we now have even the good risk paying 5 to 10% and the rest of us 15 to 20% or higher. And that increase can double our repayments when we were already struggling to make ends meet. But with far more impact is the extra risk those price increases have put on the banks. See, just five years ago, a car might have cost £30,000, a bank might have advanced twenty-five dollars as, as a loan. Now, the same car, exactly the same car, might be inflated to over £40,000 and the banks are being asked to lend £35,000, the same car. Now, they fear that if the prices of new cars stop rising, as they do in a recession and already have done, and then actually start falling, and we're already seeing this, then the banks could be left holding a debt that is worth far less than the amount they advanced, negative equity. So now if the customer defaults, the bank might actually lose money. And if more and more people default, then the market will be flooded with repossessions and the price they fetch will plummet still further. It's a vicious downward spiral. Interest rate rises put the, plus the extra risk of making those loans now mean that the banks are becoming very cautious indeed. Also, the new car we want is already very much dearer than we can afford. It's a little better than the car we already own. And if we can even get a loan, the offered high interest rate takes our repay repayments to levels that we just can't afford. The reason five, EVs have arrived and are taking over at a frightening pace. Most countries now have around 10% of new sales as battery vehicles and the rate of growth is rising exponentially. While this should be a lifeline for the banks, the opportunity to offer new loans to millions of people who have a decent budget and are desperate to buy a new car, the bigger concern is the effect it has on the value of the ICE cars they have previously lent money against. And as Tesla dropped prices and Chinese firms launched their ultra-budget EVs, the artificially inflated prices that traditional ICE cars have reached over the last few years is looking totally unaffordable. In the UK, the average price of a used car, according to REC, is around about 17000 Now, if you can now buy a brand new Chinese EV, EV for less than 20000 or in the near future, a brand new Tesla for just 25000 with no servicing and really cheap off-peak overnight charging at home, generally costs you about £4 for a full battery, who, in their right mind, would buy a used car with ten to 20000 miles on it, requiring servicing, repairs, breakdown, and costing £50 or £60 to fill the tank? Budget EVs, when they arrive in decent numbers, will totally crash the price of used ICE cars. And that scares the banks. Their equity on their entire automotive loan business could suddenly turn negative. But more importantly, this makes lending money to legacy automakers to increase the production of ICE cars that are highly unlikely to be able to sell at any price is a risk too far. See, whether or not EVs take over, the risk to the banks of them doing so is likely to cause either a total stop on lending to legacy automakers, unless they have a compelling, thriving EV offering of their own, or a massive increase in interest rates if they do lend. So, the arrival of EVs, even if they ultimately fail to take over, has seriously upset the status quo of the banking world, resulting in both consumers and manufacturers not being able to get loans or have to accept insanely high interest rates. Well, the future is not looking rosy for legacy auto and ICE cars. There is no business answer that can tackle all these issues simultaneously. So what is Ford's get-out-of-jail card? Well, tell lies. Or, should I say, continue to tell lies. All legacy automakers are already in denial or already lying. Look at the legacy auto financial reports being put out this year. Record profits, record pay rises to executives, record bonuses. Yet all have record debts, which are already at a frightening level. Toyota is now the world's most indebted company on the planet, and Ford's not that far behind. But while Ford reported a profit, they casually slipped in that their EV business is likely to lose them £5 billion this year, and will continue losing money until 2026 at the earliest. How long can they lose £5 billion a year? And recent announcements about temporarily pausing EV production in order to refit production lines to be able to offer cheaper, better, more profitable EVs in the future. These are just fairy tales. 
Telling lies gets them a little bit longer to try to find a way out of the disaster. Maybe inflation will suddenly plummet. Maybe the world market will enter a spending spree stage. Maybe EVs will fail to take over and then get back to making ice cars again. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yet others have seen all these as a possibility for years. You see, Tesla failed to pay huge bonuses, but instead paid off their debts. Tesla is concentrated on slashing production costs to make the cars more affordable, and the resulting sales have allowed them to hit mass production tipping point, with the cost plummet even further, while profit margins reach the highest ever in the automotive industry. Tesla today has a nominal debt of 2.3 billion against about 400 billion for Toyota, and a current account holding of 26 billion in free cash. And Elon Musk is still warning people we're in for a rocky road until the current end, probably the end of 2024 at the earliest. Even with 26 billion cash in the bank, that's a worry. He stands up and says all is not well. He gets hammered for it, shares crushing 20% overnight. Jim Farley and Mary, Bar Mary Barrett, GM, stand up and say, oh, everything's rosy, just having a reform, a re re retrenchment. Then um, their shares hold up well. Is this a crazy world? Well, Ford's get out of jail card is really just a short period of probation before they head off to jail at a rapid rate of knots. And I cannot see them lasting beyond the end of 2024, when things might just begin to start seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Thanks for watching. I'm Dave.